Hi, this is Dr. Vicente, and welcome to EDUC 7060. This introductory lecture provides us with an overview of what this course, entitled as Building Leadership Capacity, Bridging Theory and Practice in the Workplace, is all about. At the latter part of this video lecture, I'm going to present a couple of exercises that allows us to gain a deep appreciation and perhaps a more contextualized understanding of the challenges that are involved when we look at the notion of building leadership capacity. We begin this discussion by looking at Professor Stuart Friedman's quotation. The more attention we can devote to helping developing leaders tune into their core values, drawing on their real experience and their true aspirations in life, the more likely it is they'll make smart choices about how and where to invest their talents. Two ideas jump out for me when I read this quotation. We could have looked at other quotations in relation to leadership, but I found this one really relevant for our purposes. It talks about one particular approach in developing leaders. Professor Friedman mentions two elements. One is tuning in to leaders' core values. And second, using real experience combined with true aspirations in order to make smart choices. There are many approaches when we talk about leadership capability. And what Professor Friedman espouses is one approach, which I personally think is a powerful approach in achieving leadership development. We'll discuss more of these approaches as we go through the different themes of our course. EDUC 7060 is underpinned by four design principles. One is a notion of a flipped classroom. As you may already know, a flipped classroom is really a modification of the typical classroom model. What happens in a typical classroom is that the transmission of knowledge happens in the classroom. And the actual learning, that is when students or learners undertake exercises, quizzes, or homework assignments, happen at home. So what educators have done, have, they've flipped it. Transmission of knowledge happens at home and visible learning, looking at where students make mistakes and how they learn, happen in the classroom. This is how we hope our courses, particularly our face-to-face -face sessions, occur. Transmission of knowledge happens out of the classroom, and when we come together during our face-to-face -face sessions, that's when we are able to learn from each other through active learning pedagogies that's our first design principle. Secondly, we will be using communities of practice, or COPs, as an important element of learning in our classroom. I will discuss this in greater detail as we move along. A third design principle is this notion of reflective practitioners. The course will really encourage you to look back on your professional experience. This becomes highly relevant in particular for this course because it looks about leadership capability in the workplace. So it is essential for us to look back and reflect on our work experience, the issues and challenges that we encounter. The fourth design principle is this notion that I, your lecturer for this course, I invite you to see me as a critical friend. In this photo, Professor Christopher Day, one of the eminent professors of educational leadership, I see him as my critical friend. He provides me with inputs, very honest and frank inputs as regards the research and teaching that I do with a purpose of helping me, calling things as honestly as possible. And these help me as I grow further as a researcher and educator in the area of educational leadership. Let's talk more about 
your critical friend in EDUC 7060. I subscribe to Arthur Costa and Bena Kalik's notion of critical friend. They define it as someone who asks provocative questions, provides data to be examined through another lens. A critical friend offers critiques of a person's work and is an advocate for the success of that work. So I view my role in this course as your critical friend. I have been continually attempting to be a critical reflective practitioner. Many years ago, I used to be a teacher in Spain, a teacher slash researcher. And one of the things that I've discovered there is the phenomenon of sequema, a Spanish phrase which literally means to burn oneself. But it really means burnout, teacher burnout. I'm an advocate of making sure that our teachers do not go to the extent of getting burnt out. One of the observations I have made and I hypothesize is that when teachers are burnt out, there's really no way of rescuing them. Another area where I in the undertake continuous critical reflection is in the area of educational reform. As a former school principal many years ago, I found that becoming a part of a network of reform provides a powerful voice for educational leaders and other stakeholders to be a counterbalance to bureaucracies and to powerful interests that push for incessant and sometimes almost irrational education reforms. So I've done research and I've studied education reform networks in the United States of America, in Australia, in the United Kingdom, and I'm currently looking at similar networks of reform in the Philippines, my home country, in Singapore, and in Indonesia. Finally, when I take a look at the implementation of education reforms, I have stumbled upon the phenomenon of corruption. And one of the things that I hypothesize as well is that corruption moderates the implementation of education reforms. In some instances, or in most instances, they slow education reform, but in some unique instances, they actually speed it up. So these are the things that I continually undertake research and teaching. I'm a political scientist by training, and thus I am trained in quantitative research and analysis. However, I value critical ethnography. And when I say critical ethnography, what I actually mean here is an advocacy for the emancipation of marginalized groups. The most recent books that I have written have or contain huge sections of critical ethnography. This is a continuing advocacy that I embrace. Let's take a look at our course. The course is, if you have already seen your electronic course profile and your Blackboard site, is really divided into three themes. Theme one looks at understanding the notion of building leadership capacity. And if you take a look at theme one, it's divided into five weeks. We look at the roots of leadership capacity this week. We look at definitions. We look at leadership capacity in schools in week three. We look at leadership capacity in schools once again in week four in, in a greater and deeper content context. And then on week five, we look at teacher leadership capabilities. When we look at theme one, and consistent with my exhortation for everyone to become critical reflective practitioners, one of the things that I'd like you to think about as a learner is to take heed of this phrase, know thyself, or one's identity in the midst of leadership capability and leadership development. I would like you to know yourself as an individual, as a would-be leader, as a current leader. That is the reflection point I invite you to consider. If you also take a look at the outline, you will see that on week four, it's highlighted in yellow. This refers to the due date for assignment one. And for assignment one, what happens is that we activate your communities of practice. Actually, your communities of practice or COPs will be activated as early as next week, week two. You will be self-selecting your communities of practice. In the COP, what happens is, 
in on week four, I mean, each one of you will be submitting, that's a due date for you to submit an outline of your assignment too. And the role of each one in the COP is to read and provide feedback, input and suggestions to each one's outline. This outline is essentially for assignment two. I will also be providing you with feedback and inputs and suggestions on each one's outlines. Essentially what happens is that you are able to generate feedback, inputs from your community. If you take a look at theme two, week six, it's highlighted in green. This is the due date for assignment two. Assignment two is a, one of the major assessment tasks for this course. Hopefully when you arrive at week six, you would have already had a chance to mull over, carefully ponder upon the feedback that you have obtained from your community and from me. And hopefully these points will inform your submission for assignment two. Theme two looks at the idea of discovering relationships between leadership and workplace. Week six looks at organizational culture and the workplace. Week seven looks at emotional intelligence. Week eight looks at culture, leadership, and the workplace. Week nine looks at supervision and leadership in the workplace. And week 10 explores learning organizations. Consistent with the idea of becoming critical reflective practitioners, what I'd like you to look at for week for theme two would be this idea of agency, your agency. Specifically, mull upon or reflect upon the phrase, be proficient. So what I'm trying to find out here is, when we talk about leadership capability, leadership development, it actually is an exercise in obtaining proficiencies in relation to leadership. The third theme looks at a critique of the theory and practice of leadership and workplace. And theme three is divided into four sessions. We begin with theory, policy, and practice, leadership in the workplace. And then we look at reflections on the theory and practices of leadership in the workplace. Week 13 looks at destructive leadership in the workplace. And week 14 looks at leadership development and the workplace. This last theme is really an attempt for all of you to be able to critique what has been written in theory and what you see happening in the workplace, particularly in relation to leadership and workplace. If you see in theme two, Week 9 is highlighted in yellow. That's the due date for your COPs to provide feedback to each one of your outlines, hopefully informing you such that when you submit your final assessment task on week 13, it is informed by feedback that you obtain from your colleagues and from myself. In theme 3, consistent with critical reflective practice, what I'd like you to reflect upon is the highly sought after characteristic of leadership autonomy. And in this regard, what I'd like you to reflect upon is this notion of knowing your people. This is something that leaders need to always think about, particularly when you talk about leadership development, because one of the debates that will arise is this notion of what is more important the accomplishing of the organization's mission or the welfare of the people. In one's leadership development journey, this question becomes paramount and the answer that one provides to this question will really make a difference in the learning journey of an individual. For the online, I mean, for the face-to-face -face session, we undertook an introductory session. For those doing the off-campus mode, this could be a helpful catalyst as you engage with your colleagues in the communities of practice, as you self-select. You could kick off the 
communities of practice by introducing yourselves. And this is something that you may wish to consider. So you can choose number one right here. And when you say that, what you can say is, we'll introduce yourself, briefly describe a particular change or a challenge or an issue that you're grappling with in, within your work context. And then what do you do in relation to that? You could say that I am, state your name, and the change or issue that you're grappling with in your work context is, and then you say, ergo felix sum. Therefore, what makes me happy is, or you could say, therefore, this issue does not make me happy because. So this way, you're able to situate to us a current or even a past or a previous issue that looks at leadership and workplace, the intersection of leadership and the workplace. Or you could introduce yourself by looking at number two, this quotation by Horace Mann, education then beyond all other devices of human origin is the great equalizer of the conditions of men, the balance wheel of the social machinery. Introduce yourself and share with us what you think about the statement, this statement of Horace Mann. Or you can go to number three. And it says seven out of 100 educational institutions in Australia belong to the top tier of higher educational institutions worldwide. Introduce yourself and share with us what you think about the fact, about this fact that is presented before you. The last one looks at really dismal results for high school students. You can introduce yourself and then share with us what you think about this issue presented before you. These four points are really catalysts for you to introduce yourself within your communities of practice or even within your broad cohort, with those belonging particularly to the off-campus group of EDUC 7060. The communities of practice is an important component of our course. Our assessment tasks, the four of them, are scaffolded using the principles of communities of practice. Etienne Wenger, who is pictured right here, is the scholar practitioner who coined the term. For him, a COP contains three quintessential characteristics. One is mutual engagement. Members establish norms and build collaborative relationships. And this is termed mutual engagement. You create a COP, you self-select, you exchange contact details, you talk about norms. This is essentially the stage of mutual engagement. And then you create a shared understanding of what binds all of you together. And this essentially is, of course, the outlines that you share with each other, the rubric that you use to evaluate each other's work, and the idea and the belief that you share and help each other out. This is your joint enterprise. Finally, the community produces a set of communal resources, which is termed a shared repertoire. There will be a Padlet that I'll be establishing for each COP, and the Padlet will be the platform in which you could really share the repertoire in your COPs. So that particular section looks at features of the program. Now, as I indicated at the very beginning of this video lecture, I said that we will be looking at a very short exercise that allows us to gain a deep appreciation of challenges encountered when you talk about leadership development, leadership capability. This quotation says that school principals face a plethora of leadership tasks. And it also says that high-performing principles are distinguished less by who they are and more by what they do. And then later on, it talks about four core areas where leaders spend time, education leaders spend time, building vision and setting directions, understanding and developing people, redesigning the organization, and managing the teaching and learning program. And this can be seen from the references that you see at the footnote. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that we have undertaken, that I have undertaken, when I was part of a large national study of leadership and organizational change in one particular context, today's Global Reference Society in Education, the Republic of Singapore. 
So Singapore is now recognized as the global reference society because they seem to excel in all the international league tests that you can think about. You look at PISA and their tops at, uh, for science, maths, and English. You take a look at TIMS, you take a look at PEARLS, all these international league tables, they are right there on top. So a lot of different educational jurisdictions have looked towards Singapore as the reference society. Sing Australia, our education policymakers, or even our politicians, have joined the bandwagon, arguing, claiming that the way to resuscitate Australian education is to try to follow the model in Singapore. So I'm going to share with you some of the issues and challenges that Singapore faces in this large study that we did maybe four or five years ago that looked at leadership and organizational change in the entire Singapore education system. This table shows us what 224 principles, this is a number right here, felt in relation to the plethora of activities that they do during the day. So take note that when we did this study, there were about 260 schools, meaning 260 school principals, and we have about 224 who responded to this particular study. Uh, this is really a very big participation rate, one of the hallmarks of undertaking research in Singapore is that we usually get very active participation among respondents. So if you take a look at this table, I could ask you now, what was the component that principals felt they spent most time on? I think a quick inspection of the graphic tells you that this one is highlighted. It's the first followed by this one, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And the first one is essentially personnel issues. School principals identified that, you can see this because in the mean scores, this one had the highest among all. School principals felt that personal issues was the one that was the aspect that required most of their time. Now let's take a look at this further. When you talk about personal issues, we're really looking at teaching and non-teaching staff. But if we further investigate this item, and then if we decide to control this for grouping variables, for example, individual grouping variables and then institutional variables, would we see anything different? In other words, the previous table tells us that for principles, what was the component that occupied most of their time was personnel issues with teaching and non-teaching staff. Will this be the same if we looked at male or female school leaders? Will this be the same if we look at school leaders who are in primary school, secondary school, or whole school contexts? So when we look at leadership development, it is important for us to be aware of the contextual nuances that the phrase leadership development or leadership capability entails. So individual factors can refer to gender, to age, number of years of schooling, years of experience of the principals, and institutional refers to the context they belong in, they belong to, either primary school, secondary school, a whole school. So let's take a look at these items. Remembering again that in the previous slide, most of the principals said that what occupied their time was personal issues. Now let's take a look at this in a more granular fashion. Let's take a look at it in more detailed fashion. So the question that we find here is uh, time spent, and here we're controlling for gender. Right? So these are the descriptive statistics. 224 principals responded to this. And this other one shows us the ranks. So we have male principals. There were 87 male principals who participated in this survey that we conducted. And there were 137 female principals. Singapore is a unique case. Unlike other places in different parts of the world, Singapore has a higher concentration of female leaders in the schools. 
and also a higher concentration of female leaders in the bureaucracy. Very unique. And we'll talk more about this in the succeeding weeks of our course. The rank scores are what we should pay attention to. Here we see that females score this question with a higher point, 119, compared to men in general who score it at 102. But when we take a look at data like this, we should not hastily say, okay, it's clear that females outrank the males. We need to find out whether these figures are due to chance or whether they're statistically significant. And we do that by looking at the test statistics here, the chi-square test, the Kruskal-Wallis test in, in particular. This is the chi-square score, and this is the Kruskal-Wallis test score. If you can see, the, the significance value is 0 0.03. The rule of thumb when we take a look at statistical significance in social sciences is that the p-value, this one, should be less than 0 0.05. And when we do that, what it tells us is that the relationship is indeed real and it is not due to chance. So usually, we, what, when we hypothesize, we go for the null hypothesis, which is that there is no relationship. That's how statistics is built. We start from the position where there is really no relationship and we try to see whether we could reject that null hypothesis and say, yes, in fact, there is a relationship, or fail to reject, which means what we were really after, our data does not support it. So here, the hypothesis that we are testing is that gender does not have any impact on principles, conceptions of time spent on personal issues. The result of the test of the hypothesis tells us that the rank scores are statistically significantly different because it's because the p-value is below 0 0.05, it's 0 0.03. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis. And we say that if we control for gender, when we take a look at principles, conceptions of personal issues in a Singapore context, gender is a factor that is statistically significant. That has implications when we take a look at leadership capability because definitely the leadership capability trajectories of men and women are different. Women have families to contend with. In other contexts, like for, in, for example in Singapore, in Korea, men are in their study and professional career trajectory. They spend about two years doing national service uh, mandatory military training, which does not happen in other contexts. So when we take a look at leadership capability and when we control for gender, there are nuances that we need to remember. And there are, nuance, there are factors that need to be considered. Now let's look at it from the institutional level. My typical day is fragmented with many different activities. It's the question that we want to look at. Again, there were 224 principals who responded to that. And here we see the responses according to levels, primary, secondary, junior college, and total score is right here, 219. So uh, there are some missing values from the original responses. And we can see here that uh, in the mean ranks, the ones that score the highest are the primary school principals. Intuitively, people might say, when you take a look at school principals, I think there are more fragmentation, there's more fragmentation that happens in primary schools. One can say that. But in order for us to say that with confidence, we have to be able to statistically test that. So the hypothesis here says that there's no difference when we take a look at principles, perceptions of fragmentations. It doesn't matter what institutional level they come from. But when we take a look at our omnibus table right here, when we take a look at the test statistics, we see that the Kruskal Wallace test provides us a 0 0.03 value, which is below 0 0.05, meaning that the omnibus test tells us that this differences in rank scores is statistically significant. What we usually do here now is we do post hoc tests to find out where the difference actually lies. Is it between primary and secondary? Is it between secondary and junior college? Is it between primary and junior college? But the omnibus test. The, the total test tells us that there really is a difference when we look at institutional level. 
once again, when we take a look at it, when we look at leadership development or leadership capability in the workplace, there is an important factor for us to think about that the context of where a leadership, where, where a leader is being developed does matter and it makes a difference in the kind of preparation and training that leaders need to undertake. These two examples give us an, uh, an idea of how leadership development uh, is influenced and is undertaken in Singapore. This slide tells us the different historical epochs of um, the education landscape in Singapore, from survival-driven, efficiency-driven, ability-based, student-centric, values-based driven, which is happening now in the present. And this is important to consider because when you take a look at leadership capability in the Singapore context, what they discovered when they did the most recent study, the one that I was talking about, the one that I was a part of, leadership and organizational change, there has been a very precise and explicit shift from the previous leadership push for CEO, chief executive officer types of leaders, towards more what they refer to in Singapore as curriculum leaders. So that has, again, changed the way that leadership capability programs, leadership development programs are being fashioned in that particular context. And we'll talk more about that as we go through our course. I'd like you to, this last slide invites you to undertake reflection and action. When you take a look at some of the things that I presented to you in relation to what how what principles consider, consider is, the, is the busiest or the one that, con, that takes up most of your time. Did you encounter any surprises there? Or when we controlled for gender and realized that women, at least in the Singapore context, rank personal issues as something that they do more compared to men. Or that primary schools, primary school leaders see that they're the ones who spend more time. Were these surprises to you or were they not? What were some of your own hunches when I posed these questions to you? Did you already have some hunches? Did you already have some provisional answers? And were they proven when I continued the exercise with you, this introductory exercise? Finally, I'd like you to explore and investigate further some more questions that you'd like to reflect about, reflect on in relation to changes, particularly in leadership capability programs, and workplace settings. This is especially helpful as you look at your assessment tasks for this particular course, EDUC 7606. That is our introductory video lecture. I hope that um, you learn with me in this process as your critical friend. Don't hesitate to get in touch with me by email, and I hope that uh, we have a fruitful and enriching session this semester. Thank you.